when Fright Night was a film that came out, you know, essentially it was a time where we were really caught up in sort of the slasher craze. Um, we weren't seeing a lot of sort of old school horror movies. You know, we kind of had moved away from creature features and films of that ilk. And to me, what Fright Night did was sort of celebrate all those things that I grew up loving, you know, just sort of being able to watch horror hosts on the weekends or old monster movies that happen to be airing on, you know, late afternoons on like the local TV stations and stuff like that. So like for me, it was all of that. And then something that sort of, basically catered to being a kid in the eighties. And, you know, I grew up without, you know, having a dad. So for me, it was always relating to that journey of Charlie Brewster and having to deal with, you know, the evil that's moved in next door to him and having to sort of face that on his own. Um, and then getting to sort of do that with his, basically his hero, um, which, you know, it was something really special to sort of come out at a time when horror had sort of just taken one path. Um, And I think that's why it's always been sort of a standout movie uh, in terms of when I was growing up as a kid and even still now, and we're, you know, over 30 years removed. Hello. Welcome back to Scream Addicts. I'm Jason Jenkins. Call me Jinx. That was Heather Wixon speaking about Tom Holland's 1985 modern horror classic, Fright Night. Ms. Wixon is a managing editor for horror website Daily Dead and Deadly, a horror and sci-fi magazine. In addition, she founded the Cinema Mayhem Film Fest and is otherwise known as the Horror Chick. Ms. Wixon, thanks so much for joining us. As with every episode, I'll start by asking, um, why would you say Fright Night is your movie of choice for discussion out of any horror movie that you might have chosen? You know, I mean, one, it just feels like the perfect movie to be talking about in October um, just because it's such a love letter to sort of monster movies and and all that kind of stuff and who doesn't love that stuff especially during October like that's absolutely my you know sort of favorite time of year because it feels like the perfect sort of month to pull out all the universal you know classic monsters and hammer movies and stuff like that and I think you know the great thing with that Tom Holland did is found a found a really smart way of bringing that style into pop culture at that time, which was a little more sleek, a little more hip. Um, and that's rare. You know, there was a very rare movie at that time. And I think it changed a lot of things. I mean, we wouldn't have movies like Lost Boys had it not been for Fright Night. And I'll say that, you know, basically Tom Blue in the face because it's true, you know. Um, I mean, Lost Boys is so much fun and, you know, stands at its own own two feet. But, you know, Fright Night kind of set a, set a sort of a chain of uh, events in motion uh, in terms of kind of bringing that horror, you know, that sort of helped lay the foundation for the genre sort of back into the forefront. And that's really cool. It doesn't happen very often. Can I ask, what was your uh, very first experience uh, seeing the movie? You know, it was just renting it at my best friend's house. Um, you know, I, my best friend, Jenna, who I've known for 30 cough years, um, you know, and we always watch horror movies together. And we were just going through the re- you know video rental store that weekend and came across Fright Night and thought that was that looked like a lot of fun. And you know, for me, I didn't actually, I saw Fright Night before I saw Planet of the Apes. Um, and so for me, it didn't really, like, when I finally saw Planet of the Apes, I was like, oh my God, that's, you know, Peter Vincent. Like, my mind was blown. Um, you know, and so basically it was just us watching it as kids. And I, you know, as a kid, I kind of, like, there were certain movies I was very obsessive over. Uh, and Friday night was one of them. Uh, another one was Clue, and another one was Terror in the Isles, which kind of became sort of my Bible for horror movies as a kid. Um, but Fright Night for me, like, it just, I thought vampires growing up were so cool. Like, they were my favorite thing ever. Um, and the way that Tom Holland made this vampire movie, which it should be sort of, you know, you could go sort of the Francis Ford Coppola route and make it feel very sort of, fantasy in the old world time, you know, but to make it feel like a world that I li- could live in um, just made it so relatable and all the characters, like you knew them so well. What would you say was, was Jerry Dandridge your first vampire? Is that the first time you'd ever seen a vampire in films? 
No, actually, my first was Barlow from Salem's Lot, which was absolutely terrifying. And I think that's why I, I, I think Barlow is the reason I became obsessed with vampires, uh, especially because he was so strikingly different. Um, and I'd seen, you know, some Dracula movies and stuff like that. So I was used to sort of the classic looking Dracula. So I think for me, like I saw, I know I'd seen other like, you know, universal movies, like, you know, around four or so. Um, but Barlow, when I saw him when I was like five and that, like he haunted me, he still does. I mean, you know, he's so effective in that regard. Um, but for me, like Jerry was sort of on that other end of the spectrum where Barlow was this, creepy otherworldly thing like jerry looks like the guy that could be shopping at whole foods next to you you know (laughs) um or you know working out at the gym or you know the guy hanging out in nightclubs you know seducing young girls in high school um you know he was that guy like he just looked like a guy that could be anybody um but a very sexy version of a guy that could be anybody absolutely and in a way he's almost the perfect sort of modern dracula i mean he isn't dracula but he could be you know he's very handsome and charming but you know he's vicious and deadly when he needs to be uh much more so than say any previous screen dracula had been before i mean christopher lee is great bela lugosi is great but you did you ever find them as threatening as jerry dandridge in a way you know it seems like he was the most modern up until that point in the mid 80s when he uh when he first arrived on the scene and you know it's such a great performance and one could almost imagine an alternate universe where Sarandon managed to resurrect Dandridge in numerous Fright Night sequels. You know, he could have been Christopher Lee to McDowell's Peter Cushing. No, absolutely. And I think for me, the most interesting aspect to Jerry Dandridge has always been the fact that there's this sort of hint at humanity um, to him, which you didn't normally see with, with your Dracula characters, Um, you know, between sort of hinting at, former loves, you know, with the use of like the different portraits and stuff like that to the fact that at one point he gives Charlie a choice um, and he doesn't have to, you know, he could have killed Charlie right then, killed Charlie's mom, moved on. It would have been no skin off his teeth, you know, haha, pun intended. <laughs> um, but he, he gives Charlie a choice. I mean, Charlie continue decides to, you know, still go for it. Um, you know, but at one point, I mean, Jerry, literally says like I'm going to give you something that I never had and you get that you get that there's a guy who's conflicted because he is a ruthless killer and he will kill but also there's a part of him that's probably still yearns for that touch you know sort of that human connection um and I think also the moment when he decides to sort of quote-unquote rescue evil ed um you know, he doesn't just go in for the for the kill, so to speak. You know, he makes it about a choice with Ed. You know, this is I know what your life is, and I can make it better. Um, and I think that those it's those little moments that really make Jerry this very he, he's he's something so different than we did seen. Um, and it's cool. You know, I mean, again, after sort of friend, I kind of set the bar. Like we saw a lot of vampires that came after him that were still more like the cold-blooded killer type uh, of vampires. But I think what they were able to do with Fright Night, I think that's why Jerry Dandridge is a vampire that we still talk about, you know? Uh, and it's still a character that resonates with a lot of people. And, of course, a lot of that has to do with Chris Sarandon. You know, I agree. There is a humanity to the character there that's kind of surprising in a way. And yeah, But at the same time, it is kind of tough to reconcile that with the fact that he is kind of gleeful when he is murderous at the same time you know like he is he is a guy that you think might have had another life and might have been a decent human before you know he he was turned but you know when the vampire in him does flare up he he seems to take great pleasure in what he does yes well and again that's probably the killer inside of him you know the sort of those instincts taking over but yeah i mean you know there's again that's that duality that makes it so interesting like you as a viewer, you're kind of conflicted. What's so great about Fright Night in, in terms of the characters is that, you know, you want Charlie to sort of be able to, you know, defeat this evil and save his girlfriend. And you want Peter Vincent to be able to find the courage, you know, to defeat this monster and become the man that he wants to, you know, the hero that he so desperately wants to be. But at the same time, you still want Jerry Dandridge to be there. 
Um, and I think, you know, maybe part of that was a little bit of the disappointment that came with, the, you know, when Fright Night 2 initially came out, um, is that people wanted more Jerry and they got a different character, not to downplay J- Julie Carmen at all, because uh, her performance is great. But, I mean, there was just something about Sarandon's performance in that movie that's so rare and so cool um, that it's something you just kind of want to relish in it as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely. He's so good. And, you know, not only him as a character. I mean, Jerry Dandridge is great. But, you know, the rest of the characters that populate the movie are fantastic, too. And they're so well drawn. And, you know, there are some really cool character arcs in the movie. You know, you think about William Ragsdale playing Charlie. He's and tell me if you think I'm wrong, but Charlie is kind of a schmuck at the beginning of the story. You know, he's not the greatest guy to his girlfriend, Amy, and he's kind of a whiner and he isn't. 100% likable, and the only attachment we really have to him as an audience is the fact that he is completely right about there being a vampire living next door, but, you know, he becomes more sympathetic as the movie goes on, and, you know, he puts his life on the line to bring Dandridge down, and, um, you know, it's the same thing with Peter Vincent, you know, he's a cowardly actor who finds his courage by the final act, and, you know, God, I love, I love Roddy McDowell in that role, too, you know, he's, he's so brilliant. He is. Um, yeah, and I think that's what's interesting about Charlie is that he feels like a normal kid. Like so many times, like, you know, I love Monster Squad, but those kids are kind of all, like, cool. I don't know how to explain it. Um, you just sort of expect those kids to rise up, you know, and sort of do, like, sort of these c- completely unexplainable things. Um, but Charlie Brewster's a kid who's just, like, kind of – we all know that kid, you know, who just – everything sort of is, you know – about I don't want to say it's about him because that makes it sound like he's self like selfish, but you know he's hormonal. You know he wants to get with his girlfriend. You know he's moderately interested in the hooker that shows up next door. <laughs> um, you know because what teenage boy wouldn't be at that age? You know he's he's like every kid at that age, um, and I think that's what makes it so interesting to watch because he does become something else, you know, because he's pushed to sort of these unbelievable levels and he doesn't have a support system. Um, you know, because as we see the tide changing for Charlie in the movie, that's when his mother starts to go work nights. And that's basically when Jerry can come out and play. Um, and that leaves him wide open and he's got to become something else. Um, and he can't just be this poor kid running around trying to have everybody else solve his problems. He has to solve it. It's kind of the worst possible way for a kid to have to grow up, you know, fighting a vampire lives next door to you, but he does it admirably. I think he does. And he really earns it. You know, I mean, there's, again, it's, it's all about the character arcs and the way, you know, Tom script really, you know, he was very thoughtful with the way that he treated all the characters. I mean, even down to like evil Ed, um, you know, and just, you know, that character could have been such a stereotype. Um, but there's something so interesting with the way that, that Jeffries plays him, but you know, you, again, even when he turns, like you still, you still like this kid because you just, he's a goofball. Like we've all known that kid, but there's, there's something more going on underneath the surface than just all the jokes. Oh, totally. Yeah. And you feel bad for Ed, I think, because you can tell like, he's so well drawn a character between performance and the script, but the fact that, you know, he's. Yeah, he deflects with humor and he is funny, but he's really annoying at times with his humor. But he's sympathetic, but also kind of infuriating at times. But you can tell that's all masking something really kind of, I don't want to say dark underneath, but you can tell he's a kid who's probably had it rough and he hasn't had the greatest life. And so when Dandridge comes around and gives him that choice, you know, whereas Charlie maybe didn't have so bad of a life and was able to resist, you can see why somebody like Evil Ed would dive at the opportunity to, you know, not be picked on anymore, to not be the outcast, to have a little more power than he does. Well, not a little more, a lot more power than he does at the moment. Yeah. I've always sort of likened him to the character Teddy from Stand By Me, where you just you just know there's a lot more going on with that kid other than just sort of the, the, the witty comebacks and sort of the snarky humor. Like, you know, he's a kid who's sort of been hurt by life and wants better but doesn't know if he deserves it. Um, you know, so that's for me that I've always sort of saw the parallels between those two characters in a way. Absolutely. And such a great performance from Stephen Jeffries, too. I, uh, it's a shame that he didn't really do much after that in the genre. I mean, he appeared in, was it 976 Evil not long after? 
He did. Um, and I haven't watched that movie in a very long time. I actually, I remember renting it on VHS. I can't tell you a thing about it. I remember renting it because I believe Robert Englund directs, directed it. Um, and I think for me, that was the hook. And then I was like, oh, the kid from Fright Night. There you go. Um, I couldn't tell you a single thing about that movie. Um, I have a DVD that I haven't opened yet for years. Um, but I think this is the October I'm going to do it. I ah, rock on. Uh, part yeah. of your 31 days. Everyone's doing yeah. it, right? Uh, everyone's doing it. I'm trying to do it. Um, <laughs> it's such such a crazy month. So I'm trying to get something in. Um, we've been making it through the Halloween movies lately, though. So we're almost finished there. So we'll oh, start okay. getting into some rare and things I don't watch very often uh, for the next week. But uh, yeah, 976 Evil. I'm curious to see just what the heck I, I watched because I don't remember. I can't even remember if I've seen the first movie. I think I actually saw 976 Evil 2, two uh, when I was a kid. Yeah, I don't remember that one at all. Um, so I don't really even know if I gave it my time. I don't um, even know. Yeah, I, I couldn't even synopsize that movie. I can't even tell you basically what is it about vampires or is it about... I, I, I have no idea. I remember demons in the first one, but that's a totally different discussion. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. But yeah, he's so good in it. And it's a shame that, you know, I, you know, there was a comic book uh, spinoff for Fright Night that uh, I believe it was now comics put it out in the uh, in the mid 80s and maybe into the 90s. I think it lasted like 20 or 30 issues. But one genius thing that the comic did was that it actually brought Evil Ed back. Yes. And um, made him a prominent character. And I think if Fright Night had become a long running franchise, I mean, they needed to have done that. You know, it's a shame that he didn't pop up in the sequel. And I, I actually like Fright Night, too. I think it's a solid movie. I don't understand where the hate for it comes from. But at the same time, like you mentioned, Julie Carmen gives a really good performance. And I like Regine, but no character, no villain in that movie rather quite stacks up to you know, Jerry or evil Ed or even Billy Cole. Yeah, no, I, um, actually I have like the first 12 issues, I think, or 10 issues of the Fright Night run. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm so it's, it's really fun to hear you mention that. Uh, cause it doesn't get talked about too often. I would have, I would be up for if they would have embraced sort of those storylines that they kind of played with there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I remember when I saw Fright Night 2, I remember dragging my mom to the drive-in to see it. Um, and I remember as a kid, I hated it. I really did. Um, just because it was, it just didn't feel the way that the first one felt. Uh, I think that was my first incident of fan rage um, <laughs> at a very tender young age. Um, but it, as an adult, like, I've come to really appreciate it for what it is. Um, and for me, like, you know, a lot of those characters definitely aren't nearly as cool as anything that we get in the first one, but you know, you have roller skating werewolves and, or <laughs> vampires and you've got where, you know, totally blanking on the guy's name. who plays the werewolf. Um, but he's great. Is it John Grease? Grease? Something like that. Oh, John Grease. Yes. Um, he's a really good character actor that's shown up in a couple of things. Um, I remember him from Get Shorty, I think. And I remember loving him in that. Yeah. He's a, he's a fun one, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, but I think that goes with film criticism of, of any era. You know, you maybe things that you immediately feel drawn to sort of dismiss now, like in 10 years, you maybe in retrospect see things a little bit differently. Um, you know, so it's one of those movies that has definitely grown on me in terms of sequels. Um, but yeah, as a kid, it made me angry. I remember <laughs> being really mad. Um, I don't even think I talked the whole way home. I was very angry. So, no, I understand there. Plus, I, you know, I think part of that is just the fact that it's a follow up to a movie you love. And it's it's hard sometimes for sequels and remakes to uh, uh, to break beyond that barrier, you know, to uh, to sort of hurdle your expectations for what they should be. No. And, and the one thing I will say is what I what I liked about Fright Night 2 was sort of how you see sort of the intersection of, you know, Peter and Charlie's characters um, in sort of how they've kind of changed the dynamic a little bit, uh, which was interesting to me um, because it wasn't just them trying to rehash the arcs that they had in the first movie. Um, and you almost see Charlie become, you know, the quote unquote damsel in distress, um, which to me was very interesting because that didn't happen a lot, uh, especially with male characters uh, in horror in the eighties. 
Um, yeah, so the only me, other one I can think of from the decade would be probably, what, A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, maybe? Yeah. You know, it was very rare. Um, you know, so for me, again, things that I didn't really pick up on as a kid, you know, now you sort of recognize them as, oh, and you're like, oh, that was actually kind of smart. Um, you know, I mean, and it tried. Like, it had the best intentions. Um, you know, realistically, I don't even know how they would have initially resurrected Jerry so soon and I, I don't know I mean I think had they gone that route it probably still would have been disappointing because I just don't know what they could have done to live up to the first yeah very true now I have to ask while we're talking about the sequel so far as the follow-ups go how do you feel about the remake that came out a few years back you know, I don't, I, you know, and I caught a lot of crap for this uh, back in the day, but I didn't hate the remake. I didn't either. Uh, you know, I mean, the 3D was crappy and so unnecessary. It was just very much a product of its time. Um, but I think in terms of the story, the, the way they framed it within the modern setting, you know, I liked it. You know, I liked Anton Yelchin as Charlie Brewster. I thought... Uh, Colin Farrell was a, it was an excellent Jerry Danger. Is that the way that they sort of twisted things a little bit between the characters and those dynamics? That was interesting. Like, you know, and it's interesting because, like, um, Imogen Poots, like, I didn't even necessarily really love her in that movie. But, of course, now, after seeing what she did in Green Room, like, I became a, such a big fan of hers. Um, you know, I don't know if she was necessarily right in Fright Night, but you can see that she is talented. Um, but yeah, I just, everybody just threw so much vitriol at that movie. And I'm like, I don't understand it. You know, yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't I get it. You know, it's, it's a remake. Let's, you know, bash it. I get it. Believe me. I've been there so many times over the last 10 years, um, in terms of unnecessary remakes. But I mean, I just, I didn't hate it. I really didn't. And it really did try to do something different, I think. You know, it stayed true to the spirit of the original movie, but at least it tried to not be a mere rehash. You know, not only with um, Colin Farrell's Jerry. And Colin Farrell really is great. I I don't think he gets the credit he often deserves, not just for, you know, his Jerry and Fright Night, but for most of his roles. I, I think he's a far better actor than sometimes he's given credit for. But he, you know, with his Jerry, he creates a completely new character that's not really reliant on anything that Sarandon did but you know even beyond him I you know look at what David Tennant maybe it's just because I'm a huge Doctor Who fan I admit that freely but look at what David Tennant did with uh Peter Vincent it's a completely different character yeah and I think also you know for everybody's like oh he you know doesn't hold a candle to you know Roddy McDowell's Peter Vincent I'm like well that's kind of the point it's not the same character at all. They, there's no way you can replicate that. So why try? Why not do something different? In re, in the reality is, you know, in 2012 or 11 or whenever it was, I think it was 2011, uh, came out like, you know, horror hosts aren't a thing anymore. No. You know, as much as we, it breaks all of our hearts, it just isn't a thing anymore. So you have to make it something that seems realistic, um, you know, and that character works, you know. That sort of weird Chris Angel, you know, pseudo magic guy. Like, it really, it fits perfectly into this world where, you know, if they were just trying to do another sort of pseudo horror host wannabe, you know, I mean, that to me would have reeked of just, you know, laziness. Oh, absolutely. And again, you know, and a lot of that credit, you know, goes to Marty Knox and, you know, who was somebody who worked on Buffy for years and years and years. Like, I, you know, I don't think she gets enough credit. Um, for what she did on Friday night, because it's, it, you know, for those of us who hold it sort of, pre- you know, near and dear to our hearts, you know, it's a tall order. And even for casual fans, like you still have to make it interesting enough where you're going to give a crap um, about any of this. And I think she walked a really fine line and I think she did it really well, you know, and I like that. I like that, you know, Sarandon gets gets a little moment in it, too. Yeah, it's great that it nodded so. back to. And usually I kind of I admit this freely. I tend to roll my eyes whenever uh, a remake has a cameo from a you know previous you know uh, iteration of a franchise's sort of cast like you know I'm thinking of uh, and I like the movie but you know I'm thinking of uh, Ghostbusters the newest movie you know just when the movie would start to pick up steam they would trot out somebody from the original 
series and it's like, ah, you're reminding me that I'm watching a movie, you know? Yeah. You're reminding me of something I loved as a kid. But I will say with Fright Night, when Sarandon showed up, it was just, it was a nice wink and a nod that didn't really detract from the story that much. Yeah. You know, it was just for the fans. And I'm sure that most people who uh, came out to see Fright Night in 2011 when it came out, you know, probably weren't even remotely phased by that. They probably sadly aren't even aware of the original movie, which, uh, uh, God, that's a completely different conversation. But <laughs> oh, Another depressing conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, Tenet, what he did with Peter Vincent I thought was great. And I thought I had heard a rumor at one point that if the first movie had been popular enough, there was the possibility of follow-ups that would follow not Charlie, but would follow Peter Vincent, given the backstory that they had given him and the fact that he probably could have spun off easily enough into his own franchise. And I really, really wish that would have happened. Yeah, I had heard, I mean, I think they were kind of banking on his Doctor Who clout to be a little more profitable for them i think here like i know fright night actually did pretty well um it didn't you know burn down the burn down the box office or anything like that but i think it was respectable in terms of the money it made but i think they were expecting doctor who fans kind of show to show up a little bit more than i think they did um so i think initially they were thinking that that was sort of a thing they wanted to do but i think just realistically you know if only 10 percent of that audience maybe were doctor who fans you know, you can't really make a lot of money that way, unfortunately, as a studio, which is sadly how a lot of stupid decisions get made. Yeah, and I don't remember it completely tanking. You know, it did well enough, but it is a shame that they, because it wasn't a massive success, they went direct to video with the very next installment. Not even that long after, was it 2013, I think, that Fright Night Part 2, or was it just Fright Night 2, hit uh, DVD and Blu-ray, I think? I think so. I honest to God, I haven't even watched it. Really? Uh, I think I think it's on Netflix actually, if I'm not mistaken. It, it it's 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 um huh, what to say about it. Do you know anything about the plot? Um I know that like Charlie and Amy have bro- or broken up in it. Evil Ed's still alive, I think is what I've read. It's like another remake. It's um it, it it doesn't acknowledge the events of the previous movie at all. It doesn't acknowledge the events of even the 80s movies. It's a weird sort of, it's kind of a remake again, but it combines various aspects of the three previous movies. You know, it's um, it's kind of a remake of the remake, and yet at the same time, the villain is female. She's very... Regine Dandridge in a way, you know, but the Peter Vincent in it is more like the David Tennant version of the character, although he's more of a paranormal expert and a ghost hunter than he is, you know, a Vegas showman or a a horror host. It's just, it's very strange, but it's not, it's not awful. And as a fan of Fright Night, it's totally worth checking out just the once. Okay. All right, just, well, you, you just sold lower your me ex- on it. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't let me sell you on it completely. Just lower your expectations because it is uh, it is easily the least of any Fright Night movie. But it's just kind of – it's heartbreaking that they had so little faith in it as a franchise that even though the first movie didn't do, you know, amazing box office, they just sort of, you know, they squeezed the title dry once more on – on video and then that's that's kind of it and i gotta wonder where the franchise is gonna go from here do you think we'll see another sequel another remake do you think there'll be a reboot will it go to television like everything else does these days or honest to god like i think if they were smart um i mean and i and i say this as somebody who is just sort of over it when it comes to seeing tv adaptations of popular (laughs) properties from the 80s but (laughs) If they announced a Fright Night TV show, they would have my interest. Same here. Because I do think that there's actually some really interesting potential there. Um, If you could sort of find a way to sort of mesh some of the ideas from Fright Night and maybe sort of mesh them with Salem's Lot in terms of this town that becomes infested with vampires, like, and kind of give it sort of this weird kind of Buffy feel, I, I think there's potential there. Um so if that gets greenlit, I want a cut. I'm just saying that right now. <laughs> if you take any of these ideas, Columbia Pictures, I will find you and collect. Um, but no, I actually think if, if if there was sort of like, I you know, I know that there was like recently like, oh, we're going to do a Friday the 13th TV show. And I'm like, oh, now we're not. That's fine. I, I don't see that working. 
Um, but again, I, I didn't think Scream would work, and I, I rather enjoyed the Scream TV series. So what, what do I know? Um, but again, I, I don't think like I don't think I'd want to see a Nightmare on Elm Street on TV. Um, I mean, I'd want to see something like I'd like to see Freddy's Nightmares get remade as a TV show. Oh my god! Um, oh my god! That would be like total fan service. Although, would it be um, Robert England or would it be Jackie Earl Haley? Oh no, no, no! We would go Robert England. He can <laughs> he can do he can do little interstitials in makeup. So he's not that old yet, you know. In terms of jumping around and chasing kids, I don't know, but. Doing snarky interstitials, yeah, he he can do that totally. They, they keep talking. Um, I hate to digress too much, but you know, I whenever they talk about rebooting Elm Street again, I'm like, just just go back, go back to England, go back to England. Forget that the remake happened, and you know, jump back with the previous continuity. It'll be fine. You put him under makeup, he'll look great. I, you know, for me, I would just love to find a way to sort of play off of the new nightmare, uh, sort of direction. Um, and find a way to sort of give it a scream to it. I don't know. I just, I think in terms of the initial franchise, that's done for me. Um, I'm sort of done with classic Freddy. I'm definitely not looking for reboot Freddy. You know, I don't want that. Um, but I think the new nightmare direction and sort of opening up that universal idea of fear and sort of that that we need that in our lives and sort of just the way that they really played up those ideas and that uh, was, you know, always really interesting to me. But again, I just, I don't even know how you do a nightmare on Elm street anymore without Wes. Because yeah, you, I, cause we saw what happens when you do it without Wes. That's, we got the reboot, um, <laughs> you know? So I just, it's one of those things like I like the screen TV show because it's, Pay, it pays a lot of homage to the original film series, but at no point is it trying to be the original film series um, because it knows that it can't. And I think the only way that you could ever make like a screen movie work again is if you have somebody, spirit, you know, sort of shepherding that project that has that sort of idea at heart. I, you know, it's just and, and can sort of be able to capture what it was that, you know, Wes tried to put into those franchises. And I just, I don't know how you do it now. Um, but anyway, back to TV. I just, I think, if anything, like, Frightening would be a fun TV show. I think there's some really interesting things you could do there, um, you know, and have sort of fun with it. I, I would hope that they would bring back Tom Holland in some way. Because, you know, we've mentioned him up until this point. But, I mean, Holland is such a great filmmaker. I, you know, he, and he had a great few years there in the eighties, you know, he wrote the beast within in class of 1984 and psycho two. I God, I love psycho two. I adore psycho two, but you know, then he wrote and directed fright nine. He directed child's play. I mean, he had a great run there for a while and I, I would love to see him come back and tackle, you know, if not fright night again, then something on that scale. But imagine how great that would be if fright night went to television, you had somebody like its original creator sort of, you know, shepherding it along. I'd almost want somebody new to get in there. I mean, I think he would be, should be there like, you know, sort of being the heart and soul of it. I'd like to see somebody who grew up loving it, come in there and really do something fun with it. That sort of has that reverence for the material, but that could also bring something new to it. I agree. And if I could just have one request, if anyone out there is listening to this, that that would might eventually work on this. This please do practical effects because looking at that original movie, how amazing were the practical effects in Fright Night? Oh, absolutely fantastic. I mean, you had guys working on that who just had come off of Ghostbusters. Um, in fact, the sort of final scene with the bat exploding in the basement, that was actually the first prototype ghost that they had done uh, for Ghostbusters that was deemed too scary. So they redressed it for Fright Night. Oh, wow. I and didn't know that. Yeah. So that's, you know, sort of the fun, fun little aspect there. Um, that was from Boss Films. That was uh, Randy Cook and Steve Johnson were the two guys that sort of led that crew. Um, and yeah, I mean, just that werewolf. In a movie about vampires, to have sort of a werewolf type transformation be that amazing like blows my mind and that's all steve johnson you know and that's from a guy who was on set of american werewolf in london and obviously learned a few things um <laughs> you know and really found a way to do it in his own you know gave it his own sort of twist um you know and just the the flying bat and you know the different stages to jerry which you know we really hadn't seen that done before in terms of vampires like 
it was either I'm pretending to be a human or hello, I'm a vampire. You know, those were kind of like the two stages. Um, you know, so to have a movie that sort of gave us that, um, it was really cool. And again, I think that's why that movie became such a standout. Talking about the effects, they are so good. And I don't want to go through the whole, you know, CG is terrible conversation, but but damn it, you know, I, I miss practical effects being employed to the degree that they are in this film. You know, I miss the look of them and I, I miss, you know, not being pulled out of a film in its most crucial moments because you can tell whatever crazy thing on screen isn't screaming. I'm digital fakery as you're watching it, you know, and I, I remember Fright Night as being one of the first films that I saw where I was truly wowed by the effects that I was seeing on screen. You know, you, you mentioned Jerry. I mean, he looked incredible, but even like, you know, you think about Amy's iconic monster look or melting Billy Cole or evil Ed, you know, it's just amazing. Yeah. Well, and and one thing sort of talk about the whole visual effects sort of thing and how we've gotten into CGI and stuff. The one thing that, you know, a lot of folks for as much as the practical effects, you know, very much are front and center. A lot of folks sort of always forget that Richard Edlin, again, who worked on Ghostbusters was basically in charge of all the optical effects so, like, when Jerry goes past the mirror and when he transforms into a bat and stuff, you know, there is a time and a place for that stuff. Um, and, obviously, when it's used properly, it really works to the benefit of practical effects and really sells those things. Um, you know, so for me, that's, you know, always been kind of cool. Um, you know, for as much as it has been about practical effects, you know, there were some really cool things going on you know, in terms of the visual effects side. Um, but also one really fun story about the Amy look is that was actually a last minute addition um, to Fright Night. That wasn't something that they initially had planned on. And basically Steve Johnson had one night to build that mouth and make sure it worked on uh, Amanda Beers. And thank God it turned out as well as it did because it became like sort of the iconic artwork for the film. Um, but yeah, that was literally done in like 16 hours. That's insane. I mean, yeah, it's the centerpiece of the movie. I think it's the poster. Hell, it's even the poster for the second one, even though Amy isn't in it. I mean, it's just crazy. Right. <laughs> we just can't get enough of that, that mouth. Um, yeah. So and I, it's, uh, and as much as I like the remake, I mean, you know, the, the perfect illustration as to why practical effects work better than CG. I mean, obviously the remake had a healthy budget, but when they, attempted to do Amy's look and they did it with CG. It just, it didn't oh, work as yeah. well. You know? No, it just sticks out like a sore thumb. It really does. And you know what? And the, the thing that really bothers me is that for a lot of those gags in Fright Night, what most people don't realize is they're actually done practically because I was, I got a chance to visit that set when they were filming. Really? And yeah. And Howard Berger was on set doing things. Like, all the stuff with Evil Ed was done practically, and then they added layers of digital crap over it uh. for 3D. So, it, 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 for me, it, it's just as bad as what they did with the stuff with the Thing remake or pre-make or whatever the hell it is. Um, <laughs> where the digital now takes away from the practical stuff. Like, I saw what Amy's mouth was supposed to look like practically. Like, we saw the piece. It was on, like, a dummy head. It, it was there. It was on her face at some point. And then they just did all these digital modifications to it. And it looks like crap, you know, because they think they had to make it better. And they didn't. They just made it worse. And, you know, I don't know if it has something to do with the the effect sells better digitally when you have 3D. I don't know. I don't know anything about technology on that kind of level. But, yeah, all of that stuff was there. Like the way, like, Evil Head's, like, head was hanging and, like, I think his arm was chopped off. Like, all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, that... All that stuff was practically done, too, which is kind of astonishing when you look at how th- certain things turned out in that movie. Yeah, I don't understand that. I don't understand the over-reliance on CG. I mean, the, the filmmakers who use it best, I'm thinking of somebody like Guillermo del Toro, uh, you know, when he doesn't use it as a crutch or a replacement, but he uses it as a complement to practical effects. You know, he takes it as far as he can practically. And, you know, you look at... Uh, you look at the practical effects in Fright Night and the stuff that was done in the 80s and even on into the 90s before CG started to become a thing. And I, I, I wonder where that art would be now if, you know, not just like practical makeup effects, but like animatronics and stuff like that. I wonder where we would be now if all of that hadn't been sort of, for the most part, cast aside in favor of using CG in its place. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's an interesting tide, um, you know, in terms of the whole special effects industry. 
And, you know, Jurassic Park was the movie that sort of started it all. You know, Term- Terminator 2 was sort of the first shots fired. Um, but Jurassic Park was sort of that, that final sort of warning bell to a lot of practical effects people and, and special makeup uh, artists out there that they realize, wow, you know, what do we do? Do we, you know, you have to embrace it. You just do. And you have to find ways to make it work. And a lot of those folks will tell you, you know, for as hard as the business has gotten for them um, over the years because of digital uh, art and sort of manipulating things digitally, um, you know, they still appreciate that as a tool because it's about enhancement. Um, You know, it's the reason you can take, you know, lines out of a movie, you know, where you have actors tethered in for stunts and stuff like that. It's the reason, you know, something like the fawn, you know, in Pet's Labyrinth works, or I'm sorry, the pale man, where he looks like he has practically no legs, but in reality it was just Doug Jones' legs sort of green screened out in patches. <laughs> and it works so well and beautifully, and it really sells the practical effects. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's really tough. I mean, it's for as much as Jurassic Park was such a landmark movie, like it put a whole industry on notice and it was adapt or die. You mentioned Terminator 2 and that reminds me that the score for Fright Night was done by the same guy, Brad Fidel, who did uh, Terminator and Terminator 2. And his score is so much fun in this film. And, you know, I, I mean, there are totally some moments in Fright Night where you can tell that the films were scored by the same man, you know, even though they're totally different genres. But God, he perfectly sets the tune in Fright Night and it's um, it's playful in a way that I think that a lot of scores aren't in movies like that that otherwise take themselves you know for the most part seriously yeah I might this is my most heartbreaking Brad Fidel story ever Uh oh um um yeah I mean this is like a heartbreaker story I lost an hour and a half interview with Brad Fidel oh no yes and it was Like magic, just being able to talk. I mean, you know, Terminator, Fright Night, you know, and just being able to sort of talk to him about things that, you know, I never would have imagined and to lose all that time. And we weren't able to re record. Um, So that was a true bummer. Um, So, you know, technology has its way of rearing its ugly head every now and again. But yeah, I mean, his his score in Fright Night is is amazing. Um, It's one of the rare times where, like, you get a Blu-ray just to get an isolated score track just because it's kind of that cool. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's so great. It just everything about the movie I think works perfectly. I can't point to any single aspect of it and say that it doesn't work in the film. And I'm not saying that the movie itself is 100% perfect, but it's just everything works as well as it possibly should in it, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was, again, one of those movies where each little component fit together so perfectly Um, And again, it was at a time when the genre was getting kind of sloppy. You know, a lot of sequels, sort of very straightforward stories in terms of, you know, let's, everything was slashers and serial killers and stuff like that. Um, You weren't seeing people embrace real characters. And, you know, it gave you, frankly, it gives you real stakes. You know, you're so invested in these characters, it matters when you're watching them. You know, and especially when I was a kid, it really mattered because, you know, you just you wanted to believe that this kid, you know, who just was trying to be a normal kid, you know, having sex with his girlfriend and driving around his fix, you know, fixer upper Mustang, like could actually prevail against an immortal vampire, you know, and, you know, that just, you know, in 1985, that wasn't a thing that you saw very often. Before we start to wrap up here, since you love the movie, what can you point to as being your single favorite moment in the film or your single favorite scene? I think my single favorite scene. Um, let's see, like the teenage girl inside me, of course, loves the uh, Jerry Amy scene with the sexy time music. Oh, sure. Um, you know, because come on, let's let's be realistic or even the dance club scene. Um, that's That's another good one. You know, I honestly, I think for me, my favorite moment is when Charlie goes to Peter's apartment and Peter's sitting in that little alcove in his chair, clutching his cross. And Charlie is pleading with him to help him. 
and asking him to step up and Peter just can't like he's so broken in that moment you know because he wants to but he's terrified you know he's somebody who's never had a challenge in his life you know he's been an actor you know um and I think for me that moment is so poignant and I think it's such a beautiful moment in one of those sort of perfect moments in horror that doesn't really kind of get talked about enough um you know when you're watching a movie and it just has that one little scene where you know it's just pure perfection um and you know it's honestly like one of those top five scenes for me ever um because there's such real emotion to it and it's such a beautiful scene and i think ragsdale and mcdowell are just fantastic in it together I think that's a great choice and one I can't argue with. That is that is a great moment. It's such a character driven moment too. And plus, I mean, God, anytime you turn the camera on McDowell, it's magic. But yeah, he he really dug into that character, I think, and unearthed things that you know, I'm not saying they weren't there in Holland's screenplay, which I've never actually read, but it seems like he really gave Peter Vincent his humanity in that movie and certainly in that moment. And, and, and honestly, like, it was a real reflection of who McDowell was as a person. Like, he loved the history of cinema. He was a guy who was always recording on all of his sets, who loved to tell stories. And, you know, I think for me, you know, last year when we did our Fright Night issue of Deadly, like, one of my favorite things was just hearing stories about Roddy. Um, because I'm such a sort of a buff for the history of movies, and especially horror movies. But just to hear about somebody who also was that enthusiastic about it when there wasn't really a culture for that, like there is now, you know, and just knowing that at some point, like all these tapes from planet, all the planet of the apes movies and the TV show existed of people behind the scenes. And, you know, Roddy was filming on fright night. You know, Tom said that he probably had eight to 10 different reels of BTS footage that nobody's ever been able to find. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah. And he would throw these like really lavish dinner parties and invite like all these random people from Hollywood. And I remember like Tom even said like what at one point like Andy Warhol was there for dinner. Um, and he would always have celebrities like his bathroom, like they would go in there and they would actually autograph his walls. Oh wow. Um, yeah. And somewhere I know after he passed away, they removed that bathroom and it's on display somewhere. I don't know where exactly. Um, but it's out there. Um, and I've, I've never had a chance to see it cause I just have never gotten a chance to look it up. Um, but it's, it, that fascinates to me because like, I, like, I love what I get to do for a living because for as much as it's, it's cool to sort of cover new movies and stuff like I, I love the history. Um, you know, and I think we're, as we get older and as time goes on, we move away from things. Um, and I like the idea of preserving that because, you know, in 40 years, it may be totally different. And, you know, and Roddy McDowell was a guy who's very much about preserving cinema, you know, even beyond just horror, like, you know, just reels of, of film coming off of different sets, you know, all the different Planet of the Apes movies and the TV show and just, you know, and he's a big reason why, you know, I ended up loving like Overboard, you know, for as much as Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn are awesome and I'll watch them in anything. I mean, having Roddy McDowell in that goofy little movie, like, how could I not love that? Um, and I just think he's such one of those talents that just only comes around once in a generation. Like, I really do think he's, you know, I think he's very much on the same level as somebody like Vincent Price, who had such an unabashed enthusiasm for what he did. Absolutely. And I I can't think of a better way to close up the episode than by talking about Rodney McDowell. <laughs> so, uh, and I think we've just about reached our time. Uh, what are your final thoughts on Friday Night? Overall, like, if you had to... Uh, to convince somebody to check it out for the first time or to give it a second look, what, what would your final thoughts on the fright night be? You know, I think just for me, you know, the horror genre, you know, we're a hundred years into this genre and, you know, for as much as there's really cool stuff going on right now, you know, and I think it's a very exciting time to be a genre fan, but I think also there's a wonderful history there that, doesn't get celebrated enough I feel like and if you want that movie that really not only captures that perfect spirit of classic horror but also really became sort of a time you know it became a piece of like that that era of the 80s like that's Fright Night to me like it's timeless like you can watch it now and it still holds up 
you know, there's heart, there's humor, you know, there's really good moments of tension. You know, obviously it's not scary anymore. Like it was kind of scary as a kid, you know, but for me, like it just, it holds up so well. Like I've watched that movie probably hundreds of times, no exaggeration. And I don't get tired of it um, because it's such a rarity. And it, it was, you know, very few movies become a perfect storm of talent from the crew to the director to the cast to everybody who worked on the film. Everybody was there for the right reason. And there was like perfect stars lining up. And, you know, I think that's why it has had such an impact on the genre. And again, I think it's why it's a movie that we still talk about 31 years later. There's a lot of movies that came out in 1985 that we don't talk about as much. And there's a reason, you know, um, it's because there was something really spe- There was a lot of love put into Fright Night. And it was a real reflection of, I think, how a lot of us feel as horror fans. Like, this is our world. This is our life. And how would we react if we were sitting there when I found out our next door neighbor was a vampire? If I'm being honest, I would, um, I'd probably be kind of happy. Is that weird Honestly, to say? I, I no, would, if, I would if want to deal like with Jared that kind Andrews, of adventure. I'd be like, cool. <laughs> Yeah, it would be fun. I wouldn't mind running afoul of a vampire. I don't necessarily want to die, but you know, uh, but it'd be it'd be it'd be fun to live out the events of a horror movie in a way. I would think. You so, know, immortality probably has its perks. I'm just saying. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I I can't argue with that. Can I ask uh, where can uh, folks find you at online, and uh, what can fans keep an eye out for from you in the future? Um, yes. So I am over at dailydead.com and I'm only really on Twitter. I don't do the whole Facebook thing cause Maybe. I'm a weirdo. Um, but I'm at on uh, Twitter at the horror chick. And as far as things coming up, just, uh, more stuff over at daily dead. And also very shortly, I'm going to be announcing some details around, uh, that sort of involve a book project that I've been working on over, uh, the course of this year that should hopefully be out early next year very cool i can't wait to hear more about that every time you mention something on twitter i'm like oh what's you working on what's you working on yeah it's uh it's been a very daunting task um but it's something that, again it's very near and dear to my heart um there's been a lot to it uh, a lot i've gotten a lot more of a response to this than i thought i was going to which means it's being able to sort of evolve into something a little bit bigger which is really cool cool um Yeah. So I'm just, I'm really excited. It's just now I have to get it done. So (laughs) no pressure. (laughs) Very cool. Good luck with it. I can't wait to to hear about what it is. That would be great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks so much for your time and for choosing Friday night. It was an excellent choice to chat about. And, uh, and thanks to all you listeners out there. We, uh, we appreciate your giving us a shot and uh, more and more of you, it seems like, which is cool, but we'd really love to hear from you as always make certain like subscribe, share, and Use the comments section. Be sure to yell at us on Twitter. That's at Scream Addicts. Or yell at me. That's at Jinx1981. And I say that every week. I'm a broken record. I know. So I'll tell you what. Here's something that you can say in the comments section or tweet at us. Tell us, if you were a guest on Scream Addicts, which movie would you choose to chat about? Uh, maybe check out our YouTube show. Just search for Scream Addicts. And also, we still have that exclusive deal for you through Audible. Sign up for a free 30-day trial. Get two free books. Until next week, folks. Thanks so much. And have a great weekend.